Let's move on to the last section that I wanted to go over with you, interpreting scores on, on uh, PRO measures. Now, if I were doing a, a class on blood pressure here, um, I may not have to have this section on what, what's going to constitute a clinically meaningful change in blood pressure. Right? I know we're all, we all debate about what, what, where's the danger level there. Um, but uh, when we're talking about more clinical endpoints like that, measures that have been used in clinical practice have generated some experience there and some sense of what constitutes um, a, 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 a big change, a small change, or no change at all worth looking at. Right? We don't have that, though, with, with, with almost all patient-reported outcome measures. These are measures designed primarily for research. Clinicians don't have a lot of experience using them. We haven't generated the experiences that we need in order to understand what might be a, a, a big or small change, right? Um, I want to go through an, a quick example here. This was a, a study that we did. Uh, it was published in JAMA um, a while back. And uh, this was the HF Action uh, trial for heart failure. And they compared exercise intervention with usual care. And the primary outcome was survival. But secondary outcomes were uh, um, uh, physical functioning and, and overall quality of life. Um, and here I'm going to focus on changes in a measure called the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, which is validated to measure cardiomyopathy outside of Kansas City, by the way. So um, I've never made that joke before, and now I know why. It's not a funny joke at all. So uh, the difference between the groups was uh, 1.93 with a 95% confidence interval. There we go. And the conclusion there is that the exercise arm has a statistically greater rate of change between baseline and three months. 1.93. So, so what? what? What are we to make of this? How, how does this parameter relate to day-to-day -day functioning? Is it a clinically meaningful? Is it a policy-relevant effect that has been detected? Right. Well, um, there are several options for trying to answer this question. Uh, and actually, there's some exciting work developing uh, new options to do that. I just want to give you one quick example of, of a strategy some people use uh, to answer this type of question. Right? Um, and the rationale here is that, well, if I'm not sure what changes in scores on this measure mean, one thing I can do is to sort of get a point of reference by looking at changes on something I do understand and seeing how changes in my scores map to the thing I do understand. It's called an anchor method. I find some other measure I understand better and see how it's related to my patient report outcome scores. Right? So in this case, the developer of the, uh, of the uh, Kansas City measure was John Spurtis, and um, he and colleagues published an article where what they did was they, they had cardiologists make an assessment six months uh, after treatment, uh, of the uh, change in their patient's health. Right? And they could rate uh, no change, or large, moderate, or small deterioration, or small, moderate, or large improvement. Right? Those are the options. So there's a seven-point scale saying, tell us you know, how, your, how your patient's uh, cardiac health uh, has, has changed over the last six months. Okay? And for all of those patients, those patients all took the Kansas City of Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire at baseline and when they came in for a six-month visit. Okay? And so what we're able to do then, what they were able to do, is to look at the change in, change in score between baseline and six months and look at all the folks who were described as having large deterioration and look at what their mean change was and moderate deterioration, right? And so here are the results of that. The mean change is on the uh, y-axis there with the zero right in the middle. And I draw your attention to these two areas here. This is, these are the, the mean changes in Kansas City score that correspond to times when the physician said there was a small deterioration and 
patients who, for whom the physician said there's a small improvement, right? And coincidentally, they're both about a five-point change. One's a five-point improvement, one's a five-point decline in, in score. Okay? Doesn't always work out that way, um, but in this case it did, so it's kind of nice. So, so in this case, we're able to say, well, you know, it looks like about, a, on average, a five-point change from baseline seems to correspond to the clinician's perception, at least that this person had some small but noticeable improvement or small but noticeable decline. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean that five is a holy number or anything, no. But it's, a, it's just a helpful point of reference, right? That's just, that's all we need. And so we can use that in, in uh, when, when we express the results from this, we plotted the distribution of change scores. Those change from baseline is on the x-axis, right? And the frequency and percent is on the y-axis. And we plot that separately for the exercise and the usual care arms there. And recall that the difference, the difference here uh, was 1.93. Right? It's kind of like the difference of the means of those distributions. Right? Uh, this, this is a little more formative, though, because we can draw a reference line at 5, at a, an improvement of 5. Right? Again, it, maybe it's 6, maybe it's 4. You know, it's, we're, we're not pretending that there's anything exact about this, but just to help us get a sense, we know that a 5 on average was when clinicians said, I'm noticing an improvement. Right? So we can draw that reference line there. We can, we can find out what percent of people in each trial arm uh, ha ha exceeded that. Right? In this case, in the exercise group, 54% of folks exceeded that compared to 29% of control. It helps us just get a, a sense of what happened in this study with respect to these Kansas City scores. Right? As I say, there are other, there are other uh, approaches to trying to um, uh, create meaning around the, uh, the scores you get. Uh, this is just one example of those. Right? But I think the important point is that efforts have to be made when you have a new measure to actually try to figure out um, what, what will constitute a meaningful change or a meaningful difference. Right? Okay. So let's quickly review here. Uh, we, this is kind of a high-speed uh, survey of some, some key points in the field. Um, we talked about the value of measuring patient reported health status and, and uh, the different types of patient reported outcomes summarized by that Wilson Cleary model, right? and that idea of the dilution of effects going from left to right in that, that model, and all the other stuff about the individual and about the environment that contribute to the patient reported outcomes that we might observe. Right? Um, we talked about the different steps for developing and evaluating uh, patient reported outcomes. And uh, also went into some depth about some new developments in the field that have arisen as a result of applying item response theory to health measurement and the creation of item banks to allow us to more efficiently assess health. Uh, and then finally, we talked about the importance of, of doing something to help us interpret the, the clinical or policy relevance of changes or differences in scores on, on patient report outcome measures because uh, they're strange metrics. They're not used in clinical practice routinely right now, and uh, we don't have the body of experience that allows people to look at it and say, well, that's, yeah, that's actually a worth a difference. That's a difference worth paying for, right? Uh, okay, I think of that we've got some some time for questions. Through Arnie. Is everyone stunned? Yes, sir. Bias in this as an equal bias, if you wish. 
So when you design these things, if you're looking at, for example, depression in elderly, cognitive decline could be, you know, confounding factor. What a, what a great point. So the, so, so the comment or the question was, um, what about the element of time in the re reporting? Items usually have a recall period in the past seven days or in the past month. And to what extent is that a concern that there may be inaccuracy in that reporting? And a great point was raised that, that in, a, in a population like very elderly, where you might have memory problems, might we be asking the, the system to report on something that's beyond its ability? Um, what a great question. And, you know, um, I didn't include it in the evaluation process there, but it is increasingly the case that people will do a recall study. Uh, and uh, this has been done for a number of the PROMISE measures. We conducted one for the PROMISE sexual function measures, um, where, where you'll have people make daily ratings of whatever it is you're measuring over, say, a month. And at the same time, they'll do weekly ratings and maybe a monthly rating. And there are very complex designs you can come up with here. But the, the idea is to look at the correspondence between a seven-day recall and daily recall, average daily recall. And so the short answer is yes, it's very important. It can be evaluated empirically. Um, the FDA is, in, is, is very interested in evidence that someone can, can record accurately. And, and there's some really interesting results showing the types of, of, of recall biases people exhibit, right? The last few days are often more influential uh, in determining their report, right? The mood they're in at the time they take the measure is more, uh, uh, might be related to their, uh, their reports, right? So this is, this is an emerging science, uh, but a very important aspect of, of this. I'm so glad you brought that up. I didn't include that. Right. What other comments or questions do folks have? Yes, sir. How do you determine what a baseline is? People can really be different. I mean, when you go to see a doctor and they say, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, what is the pain? Well, 6 or 7, if you don't have a measurable comparable scale that you can use for benchmark. So, yeah, so, so the question uh, is how do you establish a, a sort of an absolute baseline when, when people, people's subjective sense of what a six is, for example, could vary among people, right? Is that, is that a good? Uh, so great, great question. I mean, the, here, is the, here is the essential fact. I was going to say problem, but it's not a problem. It's a feature. Uh, the fact of having a subjective report as the measure. Um, we, could, we could go and try to say, well, all right, let's get measures of your C fibers between these two people who both answered a six uh, and find out that the magnitude of firing of C fibers is, is different between the two, and that might be interesting. But that's awfully expensive. I'm not sure what you're going to do with it. Um, what, what a lot of people will do in this case is to say, well, let's... Uh, let's do a longitudinal design and each person's their own control, right? Another option is to um, sometimes have people rate different reference states. So if, if they are, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they might be rating how bad they think it would be to be in this other state and then you can compare what people said there and just, but it gets a little bit a little bit wonky. I think it's, it's better to just use people as their own control. Um, it is also the case, too, though, that, you know, some of those differences between people are exactly the things we're trying to measure. If I've got two people whose, whose uh, bodies from the neck down are identical, but, but one's giving me a pain intensity rating of 4 on a scale of 1 to 10, and the other is saying 8, those are different experiences that people are having, and, and some of it may be because they use the scale a little differently, but a, a lot of it may be due to this, this. It's a different experience, and that's why we're asking them, uh, because it's that experience that is probably driving behavior like seeking care, right? Other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Do you see a lot of uh, studies going to uh, mobile devices? 
Yeah, absolutely. The question was, do we see a lot of studies going to mobile devices for their PROs? I know, I think in the next lecture, there's going to be a little bit more on different modes of administration. But absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the ability to um, use an iPad in the clinic or use phones uh, that people are out walking around with is very exciting, especially to be able to measure real-time things. You know, instead of me asking you, what, how, are the, well, how have the past seven days been? I could actually ping you every now and then with a very short uh, thing a few times a day now. So that is absolutely of tremendous interest, uh, and there's a lot of, of exciting applications being developed to do that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is, is there, uh, when we have a patient reported measure, um, what's a protocol deviation related to that measure? Is there one? There, there absolutely is. I mean, if, if, the, if we're requiring that the person complete at least one item uh, and they've not completed any and the study coordinator was supposed to make sure they completed some or they answered the question that says, I'm not answering these because... Uh, that might be uh, viewed as a protocol deviation. Uh, if another example is, you know, um, sometimes the timing of when they answer the measures during a clinic visit is critical. Um, so let's say I'm doing a heart failure study and I've got a guy going through a stress test. Well, their answers to their physical, you know, how's their physical function? right when they come in the clinic, are going to look a lot different probably than right after they finish the stress test where they're not feeling so hot, right? So if I'm designing that protocol, the thing I'm measuring is what was their functioning like the week prior to coming into the clinic. I want them to take the measure right away. If in that visit we find out that that measure was, they forgot to administer at the beginning of the visit, they did their stress test, and then they administered it afterward, that's a problem, right? And there are other things you might think of. But so, yes, there, there, it is possible to have protocol deviations related to patient-reported outcomes. Other questions or comments? Okay. Well, hey, thank you. You guys have been so attentive at this, uh, this late hour. I appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>